a uh, very good afternoon to everyone who's joined in. My name is Krishna and with me we have Mr. Abhishek who is helping us guide through the different security and privacy nuances in the banking industry. Before we start a little bit about us and what we do as an organization. So my name is Krishna and I'm a director here at Saro. I specifically manage security and privacy compliance projects and Saro is a data protection consulting firm. We focus on helping our clients and enterprises improve their security and privacy posture and that is where we come from and talking a bit about myself my background has been in security and privacy since the start of my career and a few certifications for the people who are curious about certifications CIPP CIPM all of that as well I'll pass it on to you Abhishek if you can also introduce yourself and help our attendees understand the kind of experience you bring onto the table and what they can expect from this webinar as well so I'll pass it on to you Abhishek thanks Krishna hello everyone good afternoon good morning however it works for people across the globe. So I work as Director of Information Security at, at SNP Global. Overall, it has been 18, 19 years of experience. I have done all the certifications that you can see on the screen. I'm a lawyer by education. I am also a computer graduate. So privacy was something that actually drove me to do law at some point of time. And that was when GDPR came into being and I went for a introduction training. I got to understand that having this kind of background also helps you in multiple ways. So as a lawyer, you will be able to understand the illegalities, the contracts, and of course, the privacy. So that's the background that I come with. Worked across multiple domains, worked from PPOs to various service providers before joining SME and now SNP Global for last seven, eight years. Thank you, Abhishek, for that introduction. So Abhishek, what is that one factor? I usually ask this question to every speaker that we have for the webinar. So what is that one factor that drove you towards information security or privacy? So we understand that you're a lawyer from experience and education as well, also a computer graduate. So are those one of the driving factors for you to get into the information security domain? Actually, I got into information security long back at some point when I didn't even have an understanding of it. I was working with a BPO and I jumped out of the ship at that point. I was like, what is this? People were still working on URL filtering and they were thinking, yeah, that's the security. But with time, when I got the better understanding of the field and I got to understand that my interest lies over there. So I did a lot of quality as well. I missed to mention that. So I did ISO 9000, I did OSAS, I did ISO 20,000. I have done PCMM for HR teams. So a lot of audits, Six Sigma, Lean, everything. So while doing all that, I got to understand that I need to go back home. That's when I decided and jumped back completely into cybersecurity. And that's how I'm here. So coming from a technical background, and that always gives a push that you move towards something that interests you better, where you can serve your job better as well. And secondly, yes, it was an emerging field. A lot of things were happening already. So yeah, interested me quite a bit. Thank you so much. So I'll just take it over and put out a disclaimer for all the attendees here that whatever we discuss and whatever is being discussed around security and privacy should not be constituted as legal advice. This is basically based on our own personal and professional experience and none of this can be constituted as legal advice for your own organization. Of course, for me, it represents to a certain extent Saro's views as well but for Abhishek of course it does not represent his organization's views on the topic. Moving on to the agenda yeah. of today's uh, webinar. I just wanted to add in that disclaimer that whatever I tell I will talk about my experience but it has nothing to do with my current employer. Nothing can be credited back to them. Thank you Abhishek. So looking at the agenda for today's discussion we'll start with a simple introduction then we have some statistics for the people who are fond with numbers and who can align numbers with their business use cases. We have a basic statistics slides on what is the current scenario in terms of a data breach across the industry. We will also look into the regulatory overview. Now, if you look at the topic of today's webinar, we are focusing on the banking industry, which means that there are certain regulatory requirements that the banking industry or organizations in the fintech have to comply with. We'll view through those requirements. We have a few checklists around security and privacy. Then we'll towards the end focus on a case study. And most of it will be driven in terms of the personal experience that Mr. Abhishek brings on onto the table in terms of the entire banking industry. So data breach, of course, Abhishek, what is your view on how the banking industry perceives data breaches compared to any other industry which also looks at data? Because when we look at the banking industry, the number of requirements are, of course, more. And in terms of looking at it from a cybersecurity angle, the guidelines or the requirements are also more stringent. So what is your view or what is your view on specifically the banking industry looking at cybersecurity? It's perhaps the most critical 
domain in which security is however we want to look at security whether it is data breach or whether we want to defend it eventually because that's what runs the nations too big to fail is the jargon that is being used right from uh, us to here and one of these fails and we are up to nothing so if we talk about banking industry in particular i mean that runs the nation your whole economy is dependent on it uh, that's one part talk about sbis talk about hdfcs and icicis so talking about india so that's one part secondly the kind of data that they are dealing with it's not only the personal data a lot of confidential data the financial details and everything and it not only stays within the realm of the banks up front there are payment banks which have come now paytm airtel and all those even that is pretty critical because your spending pattern and everything is something that is up there and if someone gets their hands on that information in the age of ai and big data a lot can be pulled out of that so yeah absolutely critical for banking industry in whichever sense we talk about it. that's right so what would be your advice for example if you look at the indian landscape we see a lot of fintech or financial services organizations coming up so what would be your advice to these startups on how can they set a certain benchmark for themselves and start building upon that in terms of the cyber security practices there are multiple standards frameworks and all but the most easier way to go forward is perhaps if you have to look at the nist cyber security cyber risk framework where they talk about identify prevent detect respond and recover recover correct so that's that's a way to start but there has to be a lot of emphasis on once you have started you need to go back and you need to keep on looking at it and keep on making it better because uh, malicious actors are getting better every day so you will have to look at your capabilities as an organization in terms of maturing it so multiple capability maturity models are out there one can use either some standard a framework like togaf to keep on improving their overall posture which eventually helps you improve your security posture as well but yeah that's the way you need to start from the basic you need to first baseline where you stand and then start maturing from there a lot depends upon the industry that you are working in and the kind of investment that you are getting into cyber security right so what i've also seen abhishek is that the newer startups that are coming in in terms of offering financial services or in the fintech domain they usually let the customer requirements or the client requirements drive their cyber security strategy so what do you think could be some of the issues in following that strategy that you're strictly following the customer or the client requirements in developing your own cyber security strategy see at the end of day we all are working to working for that business for money any of the companies they will be driven by customer requirements because that's the primary thing that's what is getting the bread and butter however there has to be some optimum level which has to be achieved between the two and as i said while implementing all this there is something that we continue to focus on is risk based evaluation of your priorities towards products you cannot at any point of time as a cyber security professional we, we are all cyber security professionals we know that that we cannot stop the business just because something cannot be secured i mean our environment will never be secured so we will have to come to that optimum level where we have certain risk appetite we go till that risk appetite and that's where the residual risk has to be accepted and we have to go forward so a lot of vectors are there you come from the baseline you have your own risk framework and then they both merge and then you come to something which is workable perfect so i think with that we can also ascertain that data breaches are of course talk of the town these days and it has also pushed a lot of different compliances or regulatory requirements in multiple different nations and of course in India as well and as well as certain different nations that have recently come up with the data privacy law. So here we have a simple slide on the statistical data around it and this is of course based out of the Verizon 2022 data breach investigation report. Now if you look at this slide you can see the landscape of how threat vectors are affecting different industries and finance 15% of these attacks or 15% of the data breaches is directly tagged to the finance industry and the motives for most of these data breaches are financial in most cases if you look at the stat 95% of the motives of any malicious attack is under financial motive and the 5% corporate espionage that happens to an extent or it could also be on a nation level as well so importance of this particular slide is to understand that most of these motives are of course financial in nature and that is when the different industries that we have for example information tech administration can also take certain inputs or insights from the banking industry because i've personally worked on with a couple of banks and what i've seen is that their processes are much more mature in terms of the tools 
in terms of the training of the security team, as well as multiple other parameters that will help you determine the overall maturity of that organization. So if you want to take inputs in building your own cybersecurity program, the banking industry would definitely be a good reference. So we'll also take a look at the regulatory overview in terms of GDPR, the European Data Privacy Law, as well as CCPA and CPRA, the California Privacy Law. So Abhishek, what is your opinion on how has data privacy laws affected the banking industry in general? the global banking industry and what are the banking industries across the globe doing to also comply with the data privacy laws so i mostly come from the product side of an organization which offers their services and products to banking and what i have seen during this transition is that suddenly every product companies were also serious about privacy and they have to be because their customers looking to be compliant so gdpr got that revolution i remember privacy guideline 1995 or something was there in uk I used to train on that at some point and that ran for a long, long time before they came up with GDPR and the privacy directive. I said guidance, sorry, privacy directive. So GDPR actually made it legal. Great thing that all the organizations who are offering services or processing European Union data had to comply to it. Got a revolution across. I mean, CCPA, CPRA, Indian DPA, all are byproducts. Everyone comes with something that suits them better. But if you look at it at the base, GDPR still works. The same lawful collection of data, the same trans transparency, the same data subject rights that everyone talks about. It got a paradigm change in how the data is dealt with, how the data was being passed from here to there. I have worked in BPOs to start with, and I've seen how the data was played with. That was the time when news of the world would come to Gurgaon and suddenly they will ask the employees for certain bucks, they will get them credit card data. That was the time I started in security when we were removing all the papers and pens from our floor. From there, Still here, these regulations have got huge change in the way we work, in the way the organizations work, and in the way the banking sector works. Because banking sector is the sector which deals with a lot, tons of private data. And that's where they perhaps learn to pseudonymize how to segregate the data so that it cannot get detected even if it gets leaked. And of course, PCI DSS helps when it comes to credit card and all. I completely agree with that also because when I discuss with users about data privacy, the first comment or statement that I get is that they want their financial information to be secure. Apart from everything, of course, there is a lot of personal data that they will share with a lot of organizations. But the number one concern most users have is that they want to protect their financial information. And that also puts additional responsibilities on the banking organizations or the banking industry, because if that's the number one concern of the user, the organizations have to respect as well as comply to those requests. So that's also where it's coming from that data privacy laws have helped users understand their rights. And at the same time, it has also pushed organizations to become more responsible towards lawful collection of data and looking at data from an entire collection lifecycle perspective too. So those are the things. And sure. I think GDPR, of course, was a very good starting point to it. Yeah, I mean, GDPR was the one which actually got key into CIA. Everyone just talked about security breaches, breach of CIA. But after GDPR, people started talking about CIAP. That was the time that people suddenly started talking about what is the difference between confidentiality and privacy because most of the people will not be able to know to discern between the two. So got a lot of changes and of course, financial services industry and banking industry, that's the pillar that uh, any nation stands on. Just a few days back, I was listening to one podcast. This is AI podcast and Lieutenant Colonel Pavitran came on that. And he was talking about how the Chinese mobile phones can be tapped by them, back them, and if there is a need. And they can always tell where is your position. I mean, most of us in India are using Chinese manufactured, at least, I mean, the parts come from there, even if we assemble it here. So as per him, there will be a backdoor. There could be a backdoor. He came from military intelligence work a background, and he said, if I had to make it, I will leave that backdoor. If you remember GoldenEye, I'm not sure how many people would remember that. GoldenEye was one of the security breaches those happened in China. I don't know if I I should name China so much, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so that was a breach that we can still talk about that because it was discussed world over. So there was a tax related tool that all the banks, all the American banks had to install in their environment so that they can file their taxes or whatever that reason was. It was a mandate. Everyone installed it and it was a backdoor. So there are multiple ways. They are interested in your data, your financial data, most of the times. And if they get the personal data as well, there is nothing better than that because artificial intelligence makes it really, really great stuff to have. If you have a lot of data, they will be able to correlate. They will be able to identify people upfront. And that gives 
any adversary an edge over so if it is state sponsored spinach it gives a state an edge on the other state if they have that kind of data i think i completely agree on that because if people are not familiar with golden eye they may also have heard about pegasus which was also doing the rounds in the news across the world and it seems like a lot of government organizations leverage that tool to spy on people so backdoors of course we are not sure if they are there or not but to an extent if you're developing an application and if it's coming from a country then there's a very high possibility that one of those backdoors can be potentially exploited sometime in the future so abhishek there's also a question because you also mentioned the cia triage and privacy sovrat has a question and he wants to know the difference between confidentiality and privacy i'll let the teacher take the question krishna would you like to take it yeah, definitely of course not a problem at all so sovrat how i see it is that confidentiality mostly focuses on the access of a data to individual it does not talk about certain rights around what a data subject would have around that data it does not talk about the ownership of data it's a blanket statement that covers only data but when we look at privacy it's much more than that and confidentiality integrity and availability are aspects of privacy right so if you look at privacy as a whole you have the cia triage which has to be honored in a data privacy regulation or in terms of a data privacy program for a company but towards the very end the privacy segment always focuses on the rights of people and how can you fulfill those rights so that's the core difference between confidentiality and privacy from my perspective also nothing better than a teacher telling <laughs> but so but i will also add my view to it privacy most of the definitions that you will see where a person can be identified in certain way in confidentiality it may not be necessary there could be a lot of data that could be breached which is confidential an organization can have their quarterly results which are confidential before they are published if it is a public company it's a private company the data will always be confidential they will never like to release it just like that but when it comes to privacy you are able to identify a person as such and much more details about the person one can harm the person with that kind of detail one can do any other things stalk them or whatever you would have heard of this term called doxing on social media and internet all those things are part of your privacy violation only so i hope that answers i just went in layman terms but krishna thank you so much for that definition that you gave sure abhishek i think we intend to also say that privacy you know is a different domain altogether from security and that's also what we see in different organizations that there is a different privacy wing or a different legal and compliance section that usually takes over the ownership of data privacy because information security if you look at it it's different from privacy in terms of protecting and supporting the business but privacy the end goal should always be to support the data subjects or the individuals rights so that's where we are coming from subrat and if you have a follow up question or if anyone has any questions at all just put it up in the comment section it's visible to us right here and we'll take it up as soon as we are done with the slide as well so abhishek what in your opinion would be comprising for a or are important parameters for a data security checklist for as a consulting firm many a times when we have a discussion with a client or maybe with a potential organization they usually ask for a checklist and they just want us to send the checklist and they feel that it would be enough for them to help them guide that program but what is in your opinion data security checklist and how should one customize it according to their requirements so my direct foray into into gdpr or for that matter privacy is is gdpr actually so gdpr gives a very very good comprehensive checklist if you we look at it so it talks about how the data should be collected whether there is a consent or not and how are you storing that data for how long are you storing that data all these things make so when we look at the checklist that's the best checklist very comprehensive one to look at it will have other recommendations as well like you can see right here appointment of a dpo and what else to do in order to protect the data you will have to encrypt it you will have to pseudonymize or anonymize it that's how you go ahead with it of course as you said in your last statement about privacy it is all about data subject you will have to do a privacy impact assessment people also call it dpia data protection impact assessment and that will give you the baseline from where you can start and after starting from there you can have your policy around privacy and then go ahead and follow that comprehensive checklist and build a program out there it does need a separate program it is not security as such uh, privacy is a, a completely different domain most of uh, of the bigger companies actually have a separate privacy wing which looks after all the security incidents as well which looks after your privacy related requirements in terms of privacy by design when it comes to your applications and everything so that's how i look at it when we talk about data security checklist i would just want to add in a few points there around what i also help some startups follow because when startups usually come to us they do not have certain cyber security processes in place 
and they want a starting point. So how do you exactly start with security in your organization if you're a small organization? And if you're a large organization or an enterprise, what are certain additional steps you can take to mature that process? So for startups, my first recommendation is to start with an awareness program. Do a simple training and awareness for your entire employees as well as different third parties that can help you also share your organization's security commitment to all your employees and third parties. And once you can start with that culture development of your internal organization, and if you do it at a nascent stage, it's the best for you. Because if you are a 2000 employee organization, and that's when you're starting with security or building that awareness, it would take you much more time to translate those requirements and put it down to all employees. So as soon as possible, start with that culture or that awareness program so that people can understand and people can follow simple basic measures. For example, if you're leaving your laptop, lock it. So basic measures really help drive that awareness and it also helps people remember that these are the steps that they need to follow. So Abhishek, I think I'll also take up another question from the chat section from Ankita. Ankita says that since we are talking about data security checklist, can you also explain data sovereignty, data residency and localization? as these terms are very important, especially in terms of cross-border transfers. Of course, these things matter. We are talking about financial data. When we are talking about banks, we cannot have them stored in a different country altogether. And there could be various reasons for it. I'm actually forgetting the exact clause or section in the US law, which mandates any of the organization which collects the data to share it with them on legal basis on legal requirement and that was the problem that when gdpr came the earlier arrangement of european union with the us actually broke down because that law actually will allow them to share the data with us government and us law agencies so these things matter a lot in each of these privacy acts that you will see whether it is ccpa gdpr i, I believe it is actually enforced through IT Act currently, but I hope Data Protection Act also has it. So that's a very, very important part of privacy in order to keep your citizens' data secure for banking industry and keep it within. SEBI also has come up with certain guidelines for other financial data. And RBI keeps on coming up with the security guidelines just to ensure that the data is not kept out. In my previous experience, I have dealt with SBI as a SBI as a customer and uh, they are a tough customer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's the thing that takes the precedence, of course. Krishna, if you have any. Sure. sure, Abhishek, of course. I'll also take up another question, which is similar to this from Aparna. And she wants to understand the difference between a DPIA and a PIA. And if a DPIA is recommended for all processes or whenever there is a likely risk. So Aparna, to answer your question, DPIA is a mandatory requirement under the GDPR for any processing activity that is likely to pose a high risk to the data subjects. So how we do it is that there's a ROPA that is done. The first step is to do a ROPA as, as per I think article 30 of the GDPR. So once you have that personal data inventory and once you maintain that ROPA, that is when you try and understand what are certain processes which falls under the requirements of conducting a DPI. Is there any kind of user profiling that is done? Is there any kind of automated decision making that's done? Are you collating different data sets and creating a unified data set? Is there a lot of sensitive data information that is involved? So if those tick marks are put on those requirements, that is when you go ahead with the DPI and conduct it for those activities, posing a high risk to the rights of data subjects. And PIA, if you look at it, it's not a, a mandatory requirement from the GDPR. It's a good to have activity or good to have process that you need to do for every process in your organization. But PIA is done from an angle where you want to make sure that privacy is across the organization and DPIA is more of a regulatory requirement that comes in from the GDPR. So that's the core difference. But looking at the impact assessment, both are technically risk assessments. It's just that the agenda or the objective of conducting those activities are different. I think this also answers Deepak's question around data mapping and respect to regulations in banking industry. That when you look at your data, when you do the impact assessment, you get to know what data is critical for you. Where is your, where should your controls fall exactly? So that also answers that question. Question. Yep, Deepak. So when we do a DPI, we of course look into certain transfers that are also happening in those processes. We look at third party transfers, we look at cross border transfers to different nations. So those assessments are done as a part of the DPIA or the PIA activity that we conduct for the process. So I think there's also another question, Abhishek, and I think I'll drive it to you because it talks about PCI DSS. So Suvrat has a question, and the question is around PCI DSS almost covers all cardholder data therefore directly achieve privacy, but as per PCI DSS. 
then does IT technology need to follow to get comply with PCI DSS in India? So I think the question, Subrat, is that PCI DSS, of course, covers cardholder data and does it also align with privacy? And the second part to this question is whether the IT technology follows PCI DSS compliant and who are the people or who are the organizations that have to mandatorily follow PCI DSS. So PCI DSS is moreover focused towards where credit card or a visa master MX and two more vendors are there who are involved in developing that standard. Currently, I think in the latest versions, they, they have started talking about privacy more, but it was more of a standard which was to protect the overall credit card holders data, but their interest in terms of financial interest when it came to being a PCI DSS. So I do don't really remember if it talks about it does talk about identifying your assets the infrastructure which is actually used to store that data and to ensure that those are being protected but it didn't talk much about pseudonymization anonymization was there pseudonymization was not there so all these things pci dss does help it's a proper framework of course it has been working but if we look at the privacy part of it i think a lot has to be covered otherwise as well it will not cover rest of the part like dpo data protection officer is not part of it i mean there is no supervisory authority whom you have to go back and report privacy breaches. So all these things are not part of PCI DSS anyway. It is a private organization's consortium which has come up with a standard while all these data protection laws are being governed and being run by the governments of various countries. So that's where the difference comes in. Abhishek, I will also answer the second part of Subhra's question around whether IT technology needs to follow PCI DSS compliant or, uh, compliance or not. So Subhra, PCI DSS compliance is for organizations, of course, like Abhishek also mentioned, it's for organizations that are processing or collecting payment card information around credit cards mostly. The thing is that if you're building a technological solution that is being used by different organizations, and if you are an organization that has to mandatorily follow PCI DSS compliant, so it is the organization's responsibility to make sure the relevant configurations, the relevant security controls are in place to make sure that the IT technology also complies. because when the compliance is effective on the organization, it does not see whether the organization is using, say, AWS or Azure or whichever cloud service they are using. What matters is that how they are using that IT technology. So by default, most of these services offer those security features, offer those additional configurations, but it's up to the organization to take note of it and also to make sure that they can deliver it. I hope that answers the question. Let's also take a look at the data privacy checklist. Now, when we look at the data privacy checklist, we mostly focus on privacy related sections, which security does not cover, right? And to create this checklist, I think the first step you need to do is to understand as an organization, what are the applicable data privacy laws that apply on you, maybe because of the kind of business you do, or maybe because of the kind of customers you serve in different geographical jurisdictions. So those applicability or the different laws that are applicable to you will help you create that checklist and also translate the GDPR or CCPA or any other laws requirements into building your privacy program, right? And towards the whole center of a privacy program, your record of processing activities or the ROPA becomes an integral part of pushing that program forward because it gives you that entire picture or it gives you that flow of data within your organization. And if you update it on an annual basis or for the frequency that you decide, you have a very good understanding of how data flows in your organization. So there are multiple benefits to it. The first is that you would be able to comply to the requests that come in from data subjects. Second is that when you have a better understanding of the kind of data in your infrastructure, you can also directly lead it to certain cost reduction methods. For example, data storage. Storing data is costly. And if you are unnecessarily storing data that is not required, having a privacy program will definitely help you set the retention period and the deletion period for your organization and probably save up some space so that more important data or data that is actually required for the organization can be stored. So these are some benefits of creating that checklist and starting with that fundamental approach in terms of building a privacy program. Abhishek, is there anything you would like to add in terms of a creation of a data privacy checklist? I think I spoke right at the start of the previous slide, so That's I right. don't think I have much to add to it. Now let's look at security measures. Abhishek, can you help people understand the different lines of defense? The first line of defense, the second line of defense that's usually used in certain large enterprises, probably at S&P Global as well, I'm not sure. So if you can help shed some light around these lines of defense. See, 
the world is still revolving around the password how to manage them <laughs> so whether it is a passwordless setup whether it is to multiple factor authentication or uh, however we want to do it and the second thing that comes to being now is zero trust architecture we cannot so that's where the first level the first layer should ideally be in, in no case which should be missed is two factor authorization this is not only for the purposes of corporates this is also for your own personal use even your gmail if it is not set up on this two factor authentication you are at risk and your own information is at risk because of course you will have a lot to hide there that's one thing and going by when you talk about layers what what exactly do you want me to get into i do you want me to go so, through uh, uh, a defense in on, approach or what so i was focusing on the different lines of defense in terms of the people who are responsible for protecting the infrastructure as well as certain employees who are also part of the entire cultural movement around security so what i was trying to say is that the first line of defense would be probably your security champions or people who would be primary contact for each business processes then the second line of defense would could be your security team and they would be the ones who would be configuring implementing certain security solutions of course in discussion with the it team then the third line of defense could be your audit team who helps you understand whether whatever processes have been implemented are being followed and of course if they follow a standard or a procedure that has been agreed upon by the organization because during the audits it's usually revealed that every team has their own way of working of course there is a procedural document that is ready and in most cases the sop document is not ready either so you have been a part of multiple iso audits so you would have seen how much importance iso also stresses on operating procedures so right. can you also get some light on how can companies build those operating procedures and also make sure that someone follows it within the organization so it is very important what happens most of the times is that the organizations go get a consultant and get policies guidelines and standards written i mean most of the times there are drafts ro roaming around they will put it over there and but yes one can start from there but not like that you would like to sit with each of the products each of the processes in the past what i have seen when i was doing both i was implementing iso 27001 and then i was the lead auditor for my organization and then i was management representative who was representing my organization in front of the auditors so what the gap that comes here is that the people who are supposed to be on the ground they need to be aware of what they are supposed to do and how should they do it so those guidelines those standards those procedures need to be in place and that need to be circulated they need to in in multiple ways i mean for a matter of fact just for the sake of people looking into it i would send a newsletter every week every two weeks and the next newsletter will have some question coming from the last newsletter which whoever answers gets a reward for that so just for the people to go back check and remember that's how we ran the program that was the idea that uh, came to me people can come with various different ideas i went to black hat lately and, and i met there and they talked about two of the training uh, organizations came up with these comic book kind of training thing those posters you can put across the office and people can just enjoy reading them and able to understand so that's one part of it people need to be aware and then the processes need to be written what you actually have on the ground and uh, that's what we talked about initially you will only be able to baseline your security or privacy structure when you sit with the people and you understand what they are doing and that, from there you will be able to work on certain controls to put over there to to build a process which is much more resilient and robust so awareness very very important second thing the right people uh, need to when iso 27001 talks about that only it talks about operating procedures but it only says that only show whatever you are doing they will give you recommendations separately the auditors will come and they will say this is missing do it that's where you learn and you mature your processes but show whatever you are doing so that you, uh, the baselining is right and that's where you start building your processes and awareness takes the next leap and takes you to the next level right so I also remember one of this activity that this organization is doing to spread awareness. So there was an incident in the organization where an employee's laptop was stolen or probably they kept it somewhere and didn't remember where they kept it or they lost it over a metro. And what they did is that, of course, after taking the required consent from the employee, they created a video around it. They created a testimonial uh, which the employee gave citing the different activities and they also gave a picturization to those activities or on what exactly happened and why it happened and how could you prevent it? What are the lessons learned? And then they floated it across the organization to also generate that awareness. So the outcome of that campaign or that activity was that employees started reporting incidents more because then they identified that these are also incidents that we should ideally report, but we have not reported so far. So the number of incidents that were reported increased 
the number of incidents that were driven by employees decreased. So any kind of incident which was employee driven or maybe an insider threat reduced immensely. And other incidents such as a DDoS attack or an attempted attack kept on happening because of external factors. But what it helped is that it created that sense of belongingness for all the employees in the organization. And they actively or proactively started following the organization's guidelines around cybersecurity. So as Abhishek also mentioned, those awareness programs are very, very important. Now, looking at certain other security measures that you can do as an organization, certain simple activities in terms of a cybersecurity professional's perspective, but of course, it could mean that the configuration is, of course, difficult. For example, if you look at certain devices such as firewalls, firewalls are probably one of the most famous cybersecurity devices or network devices that you would have heard of, and it's being used since the starting of the internet as well. So having a simple firewall or a web application firewall for your applications will definitely help put you that first layer of defense in terms of protecting your infrastructure. And similarly, audit trails or two-factor authorization, like Abhishek also mentioned, puts on that additional layer of security. So whenever you implement cybersecurity, you have to create that balance between security and user convenience. So you cannot implement a lot of security tools and just hope everything becomes compliant because then your user experience would go bad. And what it leads to is that your business efficiency reduces. You don't want that to happen. So even your security incident that. response gets affected. I'm sorry to cut you in between. But even your security incident response get affected because if you have all sort of tools, very good, but when there is an incident, then you will be running from pillar to post that which tool to use to find what has gone wrong and how has it gone wrong. So it is very important to optimize it to ensure that we do not have more than what we need and we have enough to be able to help us in the situation of a breach. Exactly. So striking that balance becomes very, very important in terms of identifying what you actually need and how do you actively push it. So Abhishek, let's talk a bit about some challenges in the cybersecurity domain. And I will just probably start with the skill gap, which is the last on this slide, but it's one of the most talked about challenges in the industry right now. So what is your opinion on the skill gap in the cybersecurity industry and people who want to move into this industry? How can they start or what should be the stepping stone for them? Skill gap is huge. Last year, I backfilled a position for a penetration tester, actually. And I had to wait for a year to hire a person who could join. There was a lot of a bidding war. There is a lot of bidding war going on in the cybersecurity domain because good resources are hard to find. So skill gap is a huge, huge gap and when it comes to cybersecurity, cloud security, and all these domains. So where we can start, of course, there are organizations. I have four, five, six months back, I was talking to Mr. Vinayak Gurse, who is CEO of BSCI, Data Security Council of India. And he was talking about various cybersecurity related courses. Those are coming up in various IITs and various triple ITs and other private institutions as well. And they are working with them to develop those courses. That helps in a way that you are not going through some archaic course, which was developed some few years back and we are still doing that. You are not just working on computer science. You are not a computer science graduate and trying to get into either coding or security or whatever. Uh, the things are much, much better now. Your graduation streams could be pretty clear when you are starting from there. And for those who are still in class 12th and all, uh, perhaps that's the best way to go ahead. It gives you a lot of experience. I have seen few kids coming up and they had papers published before they even joined a job, which is very good to see. I floated from here, there, and I landed here. But when you come that focused, you will be able to do much better for the industry as well, as in cybersecurity industry itself. And other than that, for the overall uh, skill set and overall value that India adds into, into the world cybersecurity domain. So that's the best way to start for new people. Otherwise, there will be courses. There are multiple boot camps which are happening through various, uh, I mean, Isaka is there. IC Square, I'll say it is next level. One can wait for it. But Isaka has a cybersecurity course that one can go for. IC Square has come up with a cybersecurity skills course, which are offering for free till this year, till the end of this year. Those gives you a jump start from where you, you can start your career and then you can move into various different domains. You need to also understand whether you are more tech oriented or more process oriented because then the domains will be different you would like to go towards grc 
privacy or something if you come from a background like legal and all of course but if you are more technical uh, you can go into SOC, you can go into penetration testing you can go into vulnerability management and all those things as well so on skill gap that's what i see it i think abhishek you made a great point about the difference between the technical focus cyber security role and the process focused role i think that's the kind of division that people also need to understand that cyber security is not only hacking like the media has made it look like it's not only about hacking because when you look at it from a court Great perspective, there are much more activities you do around cybersecurity. So if you can understand the different activities that could be done, it's better for you to charter or drive your career trajectory in a way that also aligns with your current skill set. For example, if you have been in the industry for six to eight odd years and now you want to jump into penetration testing, the learning curve would be different compared to you joining a GRC role or a governance risk and compliance role. So you'll have to understand what works best with your current profile. And if you're a fresher, the world is yours, right? Explore as much as you can and find the right set of cybersecurity journey that you want to take. Abhishek, what is also your opinion on the increasing complexity of IT infra? Because there are these new technologies coming in, emerging technologies has been a fairly discussed concept in our industry as well, right? Blockchain, AI, IoT. These are all newer technologies that is coming in. And how do you see cybersecurity professionals aligning with those requirements on understanding these new technologies? Well, it takes time, but you'll have to adapt. Most of the organizations need to focus on this, how the world is changing. One example, and this is something just to start. A lot of people don't understand what crypto can do, what blockchain is all about and how can it help. It has come. It's been a few years now that blockchain came into picture. There are very good use cases of it in the decentralized finance or DeFi. So if you look at how blockchain is emerging, how metaverse is emerging, that which is called Web 3.0, this is a huge field that a lot of people don't know about. And that's where you need to continue upskilling yourself if you are already a cybersecurity professional. It means we cannot breathe. Of course, the world started with the security world started with stateful firewalls and moved to stateless firewalls. And from there, we have, we have come a long, long way. I mean, no one even talks about firewall nowadays when you talk about there must be a lot of focus on application security. And when we talk about application security, it does shift towards left. I mean, that's the way the world works. Whether it is security, whether it is your any other process, you need to go back to the design. You need to just ensure that your security is being assured right in there before the final product even comes out. So it will keep on evolving. We will have to keep a pace with it. We will have to keep upskilling ourselves. There are multiple ways. There are multiple courses out there for that too. And we will have to adapt to those. Perfect. We also have a few case studies that I'll just glance over because I also see that we're right on time. The Flagstar ban data breach. If you look at it, there were around 1.5 million customers who were affected as a part of this data breach. And what happened is that it resulted in $5.9 million in settlement. The breach was also tagged to a specific ransomware gang, the Crop ransomware gang. And ransomwares are also one of the most fastest growing cybersecurity attack types that are coming in, in the industry because of the effectiveness of it or because of the discretion of the payment method that ransomware gangs usually follow, that's crypto. But of course, don't look at crypto from a bad light. It's much more than that. The technology blockchain is much more than that. It also brings me towards the end of this session. I would like to thank you personally so much to be a part of this session and to agree to share your insights and inputs to all the attendees today. And it was a great learning as well, talking to you and understanding your personal experience. So thank you so much for that. And I hope our attendees also gain some useful insights that they can take back and probably use while they build their personal programs as well. Thanks for inviting me as well. And that we talked about privacy. Be very protective of your data. You are more important than you think. Uh, so that will be my message. And thanks a lot for inviting me, Krishna. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you so much. And thank you for the attendees for chiming in and asking those set of questions to make this interactive. Have a very good week ahead and thank you for your time.